gosh, did I have an eating disorder? You know, that kind of stuff. Because I never thought once that I could ever have an eating disorder. But lo and behold, I definitely did. Some form of disordered eating, you know, whatever you want to call it. Some people get weird about eating disorder, but whatever. You have a dis, like an unhealthy relationship with food, obviously, because you're thinking about it constantly. You're fearful of it. You are anxious about it. You know, it just consumes your life when food really shouldn't consume our life. It's just like such a small percentage. So if you have any of those symptoms, like, yeah, like, you know, you have to be honest with yourself. You have some form of disordered eating, you know. So, yeah, I just had to get to that point. And then from there on out, it was just another journey of recovery and the letting go process because it was just another phase of like going back and forth because you develop these beliefs because of diet culture, like, well, you should have like low carb or low fat or something in your diet. You know, you have to do something. You can't like just eat whatever, like, no, that's bad. But really that's what I found to help. So I just had to go through that period of letting go of all these beliefs that I had created about how we're supposed to eat, how we should eat. Um, and then just trying to work with my body instead of fighting it constantly. So yeah, in a nutshell, that's pretty much it, but there's like so many other aspects to it, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's always like one thing leads to another. And then when you yeah. get to the next step, you find out oh, there is veganism. Oh, okay, you find yeah. out about, about veganism. Then you're like, oh, now there's low carb. Now there's gluten-free. Now there's this. And then you just get more and more extreme with your uh, dieting. All because it sounds like all it started because you needed that outside validation from like your ex-boyfriends or like the other people around you that you wanted to blend in and fit in with them. Um, so that's why I always like, I feel like it's uh, eating disorders are what we use to cope and even exercise addiction. It's like for us, at least for a lot of women, uh, we use those things to cope with very uncomfortable feelings because maybe you, you felt like that you were an unpopular kid and you couldn't stand that feeling. And then maybe that's why you started this whole thing with like, okay, let me control my eating. Let me control my uh, exercising in my body and shape it to a uh, in a way that people will accept me and stuff like that. So if another person or another woman is in your shoes that, or that you were in, um, before in your past, what would you say to that woman? Like, how can she just sit with her feelings and, um, instead of using exercise or eating as a way to cope, like what other way can she cope with those things, with those uncomfortable feelings? Yeah, I know we do. We either turn to food obsession or our body obsession and manipulating our diet or our body because, you know, we feel out of control or we don't feel good enough, you know. And sometimes it's not even that. Sometimes people just, you know, they feel like, oh, I, just, I should go on a diet because everyone else is. And then that triggers in their brain, like the starvation response. But yeah, for a lot of people, you typically find, even if they thought that was them, you typically find there was some ounce, um, a driving factor of like, you know, trying to lose weight pretty much, you know, or fear of weight gain, because that's the stigma. We're like a fat phobic society. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's a journey to self-love or self-acceptance or all of these things, whatever you want to call it. Um, and the biggest thing that I see is, you know, that you have to realize that you are good enough as you are. Like, you don't have to change yourself for anyone else. And I know that there's a lot of pressure to do that. And, you know, sometimes we just want the path of least resistance, you know. So if we just fit in or we get accepted or we get that approval from that one person, mm -hmm. then everything will be good. But really, like, it's not. Like, that won't be good enough. And if you're always living for all these other people, you know, you're never going to be happy, you know? So we always think like, oh, but if I just lose five pounds or if I just um, get this person's attention, then I'll be happy, you know, but it just, that never comes. Mm -hmm. And so I realized that a lot is everyone thinks they're like just striving for this happiness or they're feeling for this feeling of finally being enough, but it, that just doesn't come because then you start to um, create the, the dysmorphia or, you know, so what you thought was going to be good enough, then like you get to that point 
and you realize it's not, and then you keep going and going, and then you just lose your life, and you lose your health, and you lose everything. Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest thing I have to say, um, Working, trying to work on that, um, trying to, you know, it, as much as it's hard to believe that in the moment, obviously that's why we get into this, but, um, you know, there's so many resources out there on working on, you know, your self-esteem, feeling um, trying to feel good enough. I don't know, write messages to yourself, like kind of set remind all those kinds of things. And they sound cheesy or whatever, but you know, it's just the fake it till you make it mindset. You know, the more you do it, the more it just becomes the norm. You know, you're, you're rewiring your brain to think a different way. Like, of course it's going to be uncomfortable at first, right. but that's the only way through it. Like change is always going to be uncomfortable, but if you want to get through it, like you're going to have to feel uncomfortable. Right. You know? Yeah. And I mean, I always say too, that it takes so much energy to be somebody else. It takes so much energy yeah. to try to be like, why not spend that energy on, on, you know, loving yourself or liking yourself and on your self care practice. Why not spend that energy there? Because we all have only so much mental energy to invest um in our daily life so we have to be very mindful of like am i investing it in feeling guilty am i investing it in worrying about what other people think of us um so i always say like be careful because instead of spending it and wasting it on things that aren't serving you do it like use that energy to on um, things that really do serve you yeah, exactly. And really question yourself, like, why do I care so much about wasting this energy on this person or, you know, this validation here or there or whatever? Like, a lot of times from strangers, it's like, why does that even matter to you? Like, really question that and then think, like, okay, if I was, like, the last person on this planet, would I really care about this? Yeah. Typically, it's like, no, mm -hmm. we're really doing it for this person or whatever or these people. And, yeah, it's just, like... If you were to go tomorrow, would you be sad? Like, really, a lot of times you hear this, too, like, from nursing homes or whatever. You know, people on their deathbed, like, they're not thinking about, oh, my gosh, I won that person's validation. Or, oh, my gosh, I should have, like, counted my calories more. Or, oh, my gosh, like, I can't, I hated my body at this time in my life. Like, no, they're thinking about, you know, their morals and ethics and how, you know, they lived their life really. And was it meaningful? Was it fulfilling? Were they a good person? Like, you know, typically things like that. So our, yeah, we're focusing our energy on the wrong things. And it's such a waste of life when you really look at it. And I'm not taking away from, you know, that you shouldn't, you know, you're bad for doing that or whatever. Like, no. it's just a perspective change, mm -hmm. you know? Um, next, I really wanted to talk to you about the fear of gaining weight because that comes up so much with when I talk to other women about this. Um, so what would you, is there like a tip you could give for somebody that's very, very, knows that they need to gain weight to, in order to recover, uh, but is very, very scared? Yeah, this is the biggest one. And it's so hard to... Um, you know, give this kind of advice to someone. Cause I know in the moment, it's like, no matter what anyone says, like you want to feel comfortable in your body, you know? And that's like the hardest thing, especially when, you know, you've seen your body at a certain place for so long or a certain look for so long. And then all of a sudden, like you, that changes so drastically and quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think the biggest thing is just being patient um, and, over time, your eyes do adjust, and once you kind of come out of starvation mode too, once you feed your body, it gets a little bit easier. Your body's not hyper-focused on your body image, you know, but at the same time, you know, you have to work on your body image while that's happening, and just the acceptance part, like, you just have to know that what you're doing right now is the what you need to do in order to gain your health, your life, your freedom, your hormones, everything back. Mm -hmm. So you have to find that acceptance in the process and however long it's going to take and whatever reason it has to happen, why your body's doing it. You just have to accept that process because we, instead of looking at our body as like an object that we have to fight and we have to control and we have to con like suppress, looking at it as like this intelligent force, you know, that we've been gifted that is constantly fighting for our survival it's not trying to like deceive us it's not trying to 
hurt us or like fuck with us you know it's trying to survive so whatever it's doing it's doing it for a good so even if um you know it's retaining water there's a reason for that you know as protection for you know your organs or you know as a quicker way to deliver all of the energy and the nutrients to every cell in the body that's been damaged and deprived whether it's like the fat gain because it's been in conservation for so long so now it has to not only make up for the past de deprivation and starvation but it thinks that it's going to be starved from here on out again so it needs to conserve for the future and so just i think the biggest thing is like really understanding why the body is doing what it's doing and then you can kind of step back and be like okay i understand why it's doing this so i'm not going to continue to try to suppress and control it because it like I'm doing this now for my health, you know, not for my vanity. And I know that, you know, it's a short term sacrifice for the long term future. And even if that's a year, two years, like that's still in the grand scheme of thing, like that's a very small percentage of your life, you know. Mm -hmm. So you do this now for the rest of your life so you can go on trips and you can have good relationships and you can have healthy hormones and periods and all of this stuff you know you just start to really weigh out the pros and cons or whatever your cons yeah. may be pretty much it's because you know what are people going to think of me mm -hmm. you know because nobody not a lot of other people are going through recovery when we are mm -hmm. so then we start to compare ourselves and we're like well you know they can eat all this and never gain weight you know or um you know whatever it is so we start to compare and then feel bad and then it just we can think all of these things but then we start to self-sabotage with all of these comparisons and so yeah I mean at the end of the day it's really hard that's like the hardest thing to do is to deal with the weight gain and I know because like I overshot a lot like I um it was really uncomfortable and then I was blaming the food like oh my gosh gluten is inflammatory or you know sugar is inflammatory so I'm gaining all this weight because it's all inflammatory or whatever but it was so necessary for my body and then it brings me to like you have to realize like what health is this giving me in return so like what is this weight what has it given me in return like what have I gotten back since gaining this extra weight so I got my period back I got my hormones back I got my sex drive back I got my desire to live life again and get out there and I got my digestion back and all of these things so we have to just you know weigh out the pros and the cons or our priorities to really define our priorities so you know if we continue to hold on to the guilt and the shame then we're not going to ever be able to get anywhere Right. So that was a long answer. And it's just, that's like the biggest question that I hear. So yeah. it's hard to answer that one. It is, it is really yeah. hard. I mean, if you, I even say like, if you have to make a list over all the things that you are currently feeling or used to feel when you had that, um, your goal body, like yes. uh, make a list of all the things you had to sacrifice in your life in order to keep that body. And then slowly, once you're trying to gain weight, make a list every win, write down every little win of all the things that you're gaining besides just the weight, like make a list over all the things that like your relationships improve, um, your hair improves, like your hormones, you get your period back, all these things, like they keep adding on and then focus on the feeling more than the look, you know, how you feel in your body right now. I feel so much better in my body than I used to. I honestly, I didn't even like that really tiny yeah. weak body that I used to have. It was so not worth all the things that I was sacrificing to keep that body. Uh, so learning to make peace with it has done so much for me. I, I mean, food is not even a, any, like, like you said, it's just a small part of my life now, you know, um, and it doesn't take up so much of my mental energy. I can use my mental energy on things that I really care about. So if you have to make a list over things like you used to hate about, your previous life and then keep on adding to your positive lifts on the things that you are gaining from it, then do that even, you know, and then if you have to read it every single day, do, do whatever you need to do to accept your weight gain. Yes, exactly. And even, you know, some people don't really see the value in doing those kinds of exercises, but they're so invaluable, mm -hmm. especially when you're going through a hard day and like you're doing all this work and you're doing great and you're 
somewhere and you feel more confident in your body or accepting it, you'll have a bad day. And instead of letting that just take over you and like send you straight back to your disordered eating, like you can have that there to remind yourself, like you can go over it and be like, okay, yeah, you know, and to keep you on track because it's so easy for those days. Cause I still get those days. Like it, life isn't perfect after recovery, you know, we're bombarded with media still. Mm-hmm. And even if you have like fully recovered and your life is so much better and you never want to go back to mm-hmm. there, it's like, you have those days where you're like, I just don't feel good, you know? Right. But so yeah, those exercises are so good. I did those too. Like on my Instagram and stuff, I have those, um, photos where I would point, you know, to my old photos, like in the fitness days and then also when I was like raw vegan and all that and I points and I'm like well this is what I had wrong I couldn't sleep I was having heart problems my hair was falling out you know those helped so much Mm -hmm. so yeah yeah I've seen those I really like your Instagram posts they're really Uh really helpful um so actually I do now that you mentioned about raw vegan I do want to because I know you did go raw vegan so if you could tell us about that because um I like I know that one person's food can be another person's poison, you know, just because a raw vegan works for somebody for a certain amount of time, it doesn't mean it's going to work for me or for you or for everybody else. And I think that's what a lot of people online try to push. Like, let's say you are keto and you are like, you could promise everybody else that this is the best diet ever and this is what you should be doing. And, you know, keto was just an example, but I see people that promote a way of eating that works very well for them, but they don't keep in mind that it really can be another person's poison. Like it cannot work for another person because I know from my own experience, I forced myself to be vegan. Uh, It was great at the beginning, but then I started, my body started to give me all kinds of symptoms that I tried to ignore because I'm like, oh, I'm just going to get used to this. This is just, um, you know, my body is going to get used to it the longer I keep doing it. But, I mean, it was just one symptom after the other and I, until I have to, like, give in and say, okay, no, I need some animal protein in my in my diet in order to thrive. So, yeah, yeah. if you could tell us about your uh, experience uh, with raw vegan. Yeah. So, yeah, to add to yours, it's like you just have to keep detoxing, you know. You just have to keep pushing, and then all of a sudden it's going to get better. Mm -hmm. But, like, it never does. But, yeah, I mean, I had the same experience. At first, I had more energy or, you know, clear skin, and um, I had better bowel movements or whatever. But then that quickly turned into I had brain fog. I had very bad fatigue. I started – or I couldn't sleep anymore. And then I was – that – the bowel movements turned into like diarrhea and then constipation and I couldn't go to the bathroom at all for a couple of years. I had to rely on enemas and you know, all these signs should have been like, this isn't working for you. But you know, there's so many people telling you like, no, just keep pushing. Like you have to detox or your body has to adjust. But so I held on to that and I held on to the initial switch, like how I felt better in the beginning, but it wasn't even that long for me. Like I felt good maybe for the first couple weeks Mm -hmm. but I held on to that because I wanted to believe it so bad because not only was I um doing it for to heal my digestion or IBS or all the other things um or my hormones I was doing it because you know I was trying to be ethical because growing up I never really even you know I wasn't too drawn to meat or anything. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I took that and I ran with it. I was like, yeah, you know, I always had that feeling in the back of my mind. So this must be right for me. Yeah. But, you know, I realized like ever since adding it back in, you know, health is improved some bounds and I'm not, you know, so in every way. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's how it was. So I held on to that belief that it would just change and it would be perfect. Um, but it never did and my health just got worse and yeah so I had to that was the hardest part though is holding on to that belief that all animal products was toxic and bad and I'm a murderer Mm -hmm. and I had so much shame and guilt around making that shift but I had to make that realization or that decision like okay my health is suffering really bad. Like I felt like it was just that I had a lot of people are like, well, how did you, you know, get over the fear of adding back in animal products? And so, you know, uh, yeah, it was really hard for me. Uh, was it for you too? Oh yes, definitely. It was, I, 
because I was watching a lot of YouTube videos on like what animal uh, animals are treated like, and I yeah. refuse to touch beef and chicken and like just even dairy. Like I refuse to touch all these things for so long. And even when I was actually trying to recover from that, um, every time I was trying to take a bite of a steak or whatever, I would just have that image playing in my head. It was really bad. It took me a while to get over it. Exactly. I had the same thing. I had that fear response that I had like wired into my brain. So anytime I thought about that, like those images would pop into my head. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, I would have like legit panic attacks. I remember when I first had my like first pepperoni pizza, you know, Mm -hmm. and I was literally like, I was disgusted. And I was just like, this is gonna be so toxic. And this is gonna like kill me. Like I literally thought to those extremes. But then over time, you know, and at first I did my digestion was so like fucked up that it took a long time to heal my digestion. Mm -hmm. Because of course, like when we go raw vegan, or we go ketogenic, and we cut carbs, or we go um, high carb, low fat, you know, all of these things, when we stop, you know, the body has doesn't have a need anymore to digest like certain foods it stops the production Mm -hmm. of the enzymes of the hydrochloric acid for the meat of all you know the organs they shut down like you don't use it you lose it kind of thing so it did it took me a long time physically too, not just mentally to overcome that hurdle Mm -hmm. um but once i did overcome that and things started to heal and turn back on and function again um it was just a game changer and like i got like that's when I stopped binging you know the extreme hunger went down because I wasn't trying to fill that void Mm. that was supposed to come from animal products but I was trying to fill it with just more plant-based foods and whole foods you know Mm. so once I started to fill it with the thing that my body really needed then all of it started to you know balance out right so yeah so what led you to intuitive eating what led me to intuitive eating? I think, I, don't, I can't remember, honestly. I probably just stumbled upon it through my, you know, research and stuff. Mm-hmm. I can't remember exactly what source, but, you know, it was some recovery source. And so I tried intuitive eating, and I hear this a lot, uh, myself included. If I, if I was doing intuitive eating too soon into my recovery and I was still binging and I was still over exercising or I still had like, I didn't get my period back, you know, that was too soon to do intuitive eating. Mm -hmm. So like I prolonged that. So I was like, well, I could just start to try to be balanced, but I was fighting that extreme hunger Mm -hmm. and I wasn't wanting to listen to it because I was scared to binge, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I had to pro, like I had to revisit intuitive eating. So, but at the same time, intuitive eating, Uh, just following the extreme hunger that is intuitive at that point so I feel like intuitive eating like the actual intuitive eating is kind of just um I don't know it's limited Mm -hmm. because I feel that intuitive eating is just whatever your body is asking for at that time is being intuitive Mm -hmm. so if your body is asking for extreme amounts of calories like I was binging on like up to 10,000 calories a day but for intuitive eating they would say that that's bad you know so I had to mix I think Alyssa from follow the intuition talks about this Mm -hmm. I had to mix the like the mini mini mod and intuitive eating together because I had to be following that extreme hunger Mm -hmm. um but then over time of course like once I stopped exercising I gave my body a break And I was following the extreme hunger for a certain amount of time. I think, I don't know, that went on for months, um, the binging and stuff. And um, slowly, as my body felt safer and it started to come out of starvation mode and it trusted that it was going to be fed whatever it wanted, whenever it wanted, um, then it slowly, like it was just a natural progression into what people call intuitive eating. Like, you know, you just like slowly your hunger starts to die down, slowly your satiety starts to go up. Um, and it was just a natural progression. I mean, that's another thing is these labels. I feel like people want to have a label. So like you're not, now you're in recovery, so you have to have a label, you know, you have to be an intuitive eater or whatever. And I respect it though. I'm not trying to bash intuitive eating. Like I talk about it too, but, um, that's just one thing to get an understanding of something, but like to get away from these labels, I think will be so helpful to not limit yourself to just what intuitive eating is saying or what mini mod is saying because then people say they get their period back and then um so they're following mini mod 
and they keep eating over to hit a amount of calories, even though their body is naturally trying to lower the satiety again or the lower the hunger again and balance it out. But now you're like over eating, you know, it's just a natural progression of balancing out that we have to follow. And they're, they're slight little subtle communication tools, but we have to listen to that and tune into that. So, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad that you brought that up that you said, um, cause one of the questions I get a lot is, Oh, well, if I, um, let myself listen to my body and let it have whatever I, it wants, then it's, it's going to get out of control. I'm just going to eat for a long time. But you mentioned that it doesn't last. This phase does not last forever. This is a very natural way for your body to react for all the starvation. Even, even if you haven't done this for a long time, you know, even if it's just a year or a few months, it, it's different for everybody. But it does not last forever. And I think it's it's really hard for uh, me to explain to other women that, you know, or for them to believe me when I say this does not last forever, this whole thing with extreme hunger and stuff like that. But for you're a great example that, you know, you, you can find a balance if, yes. as long as you keep overeating when you need to overeat um, and you keep listening to your body when you need to listen to your body. That's what really matters in the end. Cause like it's, it's like um, building a relationship when, with, with, your body all over again you've been kind of mean to it for so long so it's not going to trust you right away even though you feed it a whole bunch it's gonna take a long time it's like you let's say you've been mean to a person you're after like two years of being so mean to another person and you go to apologize they're not gonna just forgive you right away and trust you and be best friends again it's gonna take a long time so same thing with your body I always say it's gonna take a long time time to tr uh, build that trust again Oh my gosh, that's a good analogy. I haven't heard that one. That's really good. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. And yeah, it's hard for people to believe you. Because <laughs> I never believed anyone. I was like, yeah, you know, like it worked for them. But mm -hmm. I don't quite believe it for myself. But I still kept going. Mm -hmm. Because I was like, well, I get to eat all this food. So that's all I wanted the whole time anyways. Yeah. So I just kept going with it. And it just, it happened. And like, it happens, it doesn't happen abruptly. It happens like slowly so if people are trying to look for that change or whatever mm -hmm. then they're always going to be like disappointed because it just it doesn't happen like that it's just like slow little subtle changes right. of you know trust or you know all of these things mm -hmm. so yeah I mean I, I remember just to say really quick I remember back when um I was looking at like my old Fitzbo post on like another account mm -hmm. that got reactivated randomly. I don't know how. So I was looking and I was like, yeah, you know, like I have the obesity gene in my family. Like oh, everyone's obese. So like, you know, I am predestined to being overweight. So like I always have, you know, I never feel satisfied. That's just me. And that was my story that I had created. Mm -hmm. But it was just because I was like starving, you know. And for whatever reason theirs are, you know, there's been a lot of trauma in each person, like different kinds of trauma, you know, like suicides and like having to deal with that kind of stuff, you know, that's their reason. But for mine, I was just starving, you know, and then from my past things. But, you know, and so I would have never believed that for me, I could have had satiety or that, you know, not a bottomless pit hunger anymore, but it happens. So, yeah, yeah. like you said, it's hard to believe, but it happens. All right, so um, one more thing that I wanted to talk to okay. you about is um, is about vacations and how to feel. I know you just came back home from a vacation, and I just want to like I just want to ask you how are your vacations differently now than when you were in your eating disorder days? <laughs> yeah, like night and day. I mean, if I ever went on a vacation, because typically I would just pass up all opportunities like because I used to be the one like carrying around like that six pack fitness you know what I'm yeah. talking about like the lunch pail with like six meals <laughs> so if I did it if like I had to if I was leaving the house I had to bring that or I had to call ahead to the restaurant and be like so like what do you cook with like mm -hmm. do you have this option you know it's just so neurotic so like I would pretty much that was too stressful for me to do that so pretty much I would just like not travel even though I had a lot of opportunities to like visit certain family members in different states or just even in the same state California is like eight hours away to the northern California but so 
And then if I did travel, yeah, it was just like, I couldn't enjoy it because the whole time I was just thinking about like where my next meal was going to come from. And like, I was freaking out if it was going to be clean or pure enough. I, you know, had to make sure like I had access to a farmer's market or a grocery store and then I had to load up and then I had to bring like my bag of grapes or like a smoothie to a restaurant and it was just so unenjoyable so like typically I would shy away from it versus now where it's just not at all I can and I can enjoy where I'm going like we're on a road trip and I make videos on my channel you know about how um, being spontaneous was a big a priority for me so because I like to go camping or on road trips so if I need to stop at a fast food restaurant like I can do it mm-hmm. without having a panic attack and without having digestive reactions because that's healed you know mm-hmm. and I can have whatever I want like we can have like a can of beans or a can of like tuna or like a can like you know canned stuff or packaged stuff or you know a bunch of salt and like I don't care I don't think about it Mm -hmm. so when I'm not thinking about what's in my food or where I'm gonna get my food like I can enjoy my surroundings I can enjoy the people around me I can go swimming I can go hiking or I could just hang out on the hammock like not thinking about food you know so it's just not that ever looming like thought about food you know that takes over your life. So it's just night and day, like, I can live my life again. So, Exactly. You know. I mean, the only thing I will say about food, if you are going to worry about food, is worry about if, let's say you go to Italy, and yes. you don't want to come back home from Italy regretting not trying their pasta or their pizza or their cheese yeah. or wine. Like, rem- like, how? think about how do you want to remember that vacation? Do you want to come home regretting all the things that you wanted to do, but you were so scared to do because it had to do with food or you wanted to spend an extra hour at the hotel gym working out? Like, how do you want to remember your vacation? That's huge, too. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. People will just spend their whole vacation either like in the hotel gym or um, prepping their food or just, you know, just isolated in their little bubble. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. How do you want to remember that? that on your deathbed again like do you, are you gonna remember like how many calories you ate on that trip are you gonna remember like all the experiences and like um, talking with people or experiencing their culture and learning a bunch of things like I don't know it just comes down to like what you want out of life again exactly. so exactly yeah well I could talk to you forever about yeah, all the you things know. and I mean that's not even all, like I want to talk to talk to you about so much more but um we just have to wrap this up i just have like one more question for you where can people find you okay so yeah on instagram and youtube damn the diets um that's pretty much where i'm at or my website damn the diets.com and then if you want to check out my book it has more about my story damn the diets everything's just damn the diets so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, I really want to thank you for your time and being here with me and sharing your story and sharing with us so many amazing tips that I know all these other women that are going to be watching uh, will benefit from. So thank you so much, Kayla. Well, thank you for having me, Rita. Awesome. This has been fun. I know I could talk to you forever, so we should do this again. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. I really had a great conversation with Kayla. It felt more like a conversation than it felt like an interview. Uh, We talked about a lot of things that I wasn't even planning to talk about. And um, she continues to share her story about how she went raw vegan and how she, what helped her to get out of that physically and mentally recover from, you know, the diet culture and especially with the raw vegan because it took up a lot of her mental energy. So she gives you a few tips on how you you can get out of that place if that's where you are right now. Um, So yes, if you did like this video, make sure that you like it you like the video, make sure that you subscribe to my channel and also share it with anybody else that you think will benefit from it. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time.